Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Shalindria Spears Dulce. Um, I'm the president of TTFCA, and I'm so excited, I'm so honored, so enamored to be standing here before you for the 11th annual Texas Track and Field Coaches Association Hall of Fame ceremony. Even the weather couldn't keep us from celebrating tonight, so we're here. Um, I would like to start off by recognizing all of our board members. Um, our executive director, Stuart Cantor. Can you wave, Stuart? Our vice president, who just introduced me, Mr. Shelton Irvin. And if I can just ask all of our remaining board members to please stand and be recognized. Track and field is a sport that has brought us all together today. But more importantly, we are celebrating poignant figures who have contributed so much to the sport we love. For many of us, it is about more than the sport. It is the feeling and emotion that is generated from the sport. That feeling of watching sand granules fly from the graceful landing of a long and triple jumper. The breath that you forget to take from the moment you hear set to the sounding of the starter pistol, signifying the start of the race. It's the beloved comeback story, when we see an anchor leg defy all odds and walk down the competition to cross the line in first place. And it's the watching, eyes glued to the track, as two distance or mid-distance runners race outrace each other to the finish line. Perhaps it's the moment in time which is frozen from the release of the shot put or discus until it hits the ground. Whether watching a pole vaulter or high jumper barely escape the fate of a falling bar, Watching the final turn of a perfectly executed 400 meters, the unparalleled rhythm of a hurdle race, or the excitement and anticipation as we wait for the recount of what happened today in tomorrow's media outlets. Track and field is art in motion. It is seconds and milliseconds and quarters of inches which determine champions. It's a sport we love and will cherish forever. And tonight, we will celebrate some of the finest that Texas track and field has ever output. On behalf of TTFCA, I'd like to welcome you to the 2020 Hall of Fame class induction ceremony. Woo. Now I'd like to introduce you to our MC for the night. Um, Don Garrett has been a track and field fan since 1956, when as a one-year-old toddler, his, his Abilene Christian College alumni parents took him to see Bobby Morrow run just months before Morrow would win three gold medals in the Melbourne Olympics. For the past 35 years, Don has been announcing track meets around the Southwest, starting with the home meets at ACU, now including home meets at Texas Tech, the University of Texas, Baylor, TCU, North Texas, West Texas A&M, Angelo State, McMurray, and Hardin-Simmons. Don has announced conference meets for the Big 12, Sunbelt Conference, um, Southland uh, Conference, Conference USA, Lone State, and American Southwest. He has also said that the privilege of announce, I'm sorry, he's also had the privilege of announcing at the uh, National JC Meet, the NCAA Division II Championships, the NCAA West Regional Prelim Meet, and this past spring, the NCAA Division I National Track and Field Championships. I'll give him a hand clap for that. This spring will be Don's 13th year as a part of the Texas Relays announcing staff. First and foremost, Don is a huge fan of the sport in track and field. It is the greatest sport in the world and he approaches every meet with the desire that he, the attendees at the track meet know something about everyone participating at the meet. Don is appreciative of the huge honor he has been granted to participate in the TTFCA Hall of Fame induction ceremonies for the second year in a row, a role that was held for many years by his friend and mentor, Bill Melton. So without further ado, please help me welcome Mr. Don Garrett. Thank you very much, Alindria. And I did practice her name back when I was an announcer, I can promise that. I appreciate the opportunity to be the presenter at this year's Hall of Fame induction again. I love the sport of track and field. It is and always has been my favorite sport from when I was one year old. I don't actually remember seeing Bobby Morrow run, but I've heard that story so many times I feel like I do remember that. The opportunity to present at this occasion is particularly compelling to me 
because my friend and mentor is, was mentioned by Shalindria, Bill Melton used to present at the proceedings. I sat in the audience, the same place where you are, previous occasions when he presented. 2019 was a special year in so many ways, a season of triumph for so many. At the state track meet, uh, the greatest, incidentally, the greatest state track meet in the world, uh, for the boys, Klein Forrest eking out a victory by two points over Houston Strait Jesuit. Fort Ben Marshall winning the 5A title. La Vega the 4A title. Dallas Life of Oak Cliff winning at 3A. Milano at 2A. And Paducah winning the 1A title. On the girls' side, DeSoto, DeSoto demolished the field in the 6A title. Lancaster added another trophy to their 5A trophy case. Canyon won the 4A title. The Atlanta Jackrabbits won the 3A title, Sunray winning the 2A, and Happy Texas, one of my favorite towns to announce, Happy Texas taking the 1A title. On the TAP side, San Antonio Christian in TAPS 5A and Shiner St. Paul in TAPS 2A both won the boys and the girls title in the same year. On the college level, Texas was blessed to hold two national championship meets within this great state last year. In Austin last June, the Texas Tech men's team became the first Texas Tech men's team to win a national championship in any sport as they won the national meet. And don't forget that Houston was in third place, Texas A&M was in sixth, and the University of Texas finished in ninth. Four of the top teams in the nation for right here in the Lone Star State. On the women's side, Texas A&M placed fourth. Texas was also the home to the Division II national championship hosted by Texas A&M Kingsville. At the D2 men's meet, Angelo State was beaten by one lousy point for the championship. Texas A&M was sixth and West Texas A&M tenth. For the women, West Texas A&M was fourth. Angelo was ninth at the NAA Nationals. Uh, Wayland Baptist placed third in the men's and fourth in the women's. At the JC National meet, South Plains was third in both men and women. And Western Texas was sixth for both men and women. Texas track at the collegiate level was represented at every single level of collegiate competition. Even in a year of triumph for so many, there's also sadness. On December the 23rd, just two and a half weeks ago, iconic coach Ernest James passed away. While at Dallas Roosevelt, Coach James coached four high school titles. And no one can, who attended the Texas track meet for many years will ever forget those amazing relays that he fielded by Rose, at Roosevelt back in the mid-80s. Teams that included Hall of Fame member Roy the Robot Martin. Coach James will be, was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2012. And he will be sorely missed. If we can have just a brief moment of quiet in honor of Ernest James. Thank you. The format of the program this year has changed, and the yearly awards that have been given to the current athletes and coaches will be saved for the meet of champions this coming spring. So we're going to be able to move straight into the Hall of Fame segment of the festivities. And for those of you who looked at the schedule closely, you may have noticed that the Hall of Fame induction and the coaches social is scheduled to go to 11 p.m. I can assure you, and sure, I will assure you that the induction portion is not going to 11 p.m., although it may have felt like it a few times in past years. First of all, as we get ready to start, do we have any of our current Hall of Fame members? If you'll please stand, if you're a current Hall of Fame member, in the Texas Track and Field Hall of Fame. As we move on to the actual presentation of each individual, I will give the info on the person, the, the, the uh, recipient. They will step up and get their plaque from Herb and Mike Shaner. Now, a question to all of you track fans and track runners. How many of you participate in the Shaner Relays back in your day. Fewer hands than I might have even expected. What a great meet that has been over the years. And then after that, the, the recipient will step up and uh, speak after that. So we're going to get started. We're going to go in alphabetic order. So we'll start with Benny Brazell. Yeah. Yeah. Benny. Benny was a two-time state champion of the 300 hurdles for Houston Westbury in 2000 and 2001. I got some good stuff on you, Benny. He then went on a story career at LSU. At LSU, Benny ended up a national champion five times on LSU relays. He would end up as All-American 14 times in the 400 hurdles and the relays, the second most All-American titles ever won by an LSU athlete in their story track history. 
In his senior year, Benny ran one of the all-time great races in NCAA history with Karan Clement as both men broke the NCAA record in the 400 hurdles with Clement winning by a fraction with a 47.56 to Benny's 47.67, which is still the LSU school record. Your, your most famous race, you got second. How, how's that, Benny? <laughs> While a student at LSU, Benny qualified for the U.S. Olympic team in the 400 hurdles, and at Athens at the Centennial Olympics, Benny made it to the finals while still a college student, placing eighth at the Olympic Games. As most of you know, Benny was also a wide receiver in football and was drafted in the seventh round of the NFL draft by the Cincinnati Bengals. Benny, Benny was on the LSU National Championship track and field team outdoors in 2002 and indoors in 2004 and was on the 2003 LSU National Championship football team, the only athlete in LSU history to be on national championship team in two sports. Yeah. And really, we can count that three sports if you count indoor and outdoors, two separate ones. Benny returned to his alma mater in 2011 and has made his mark as an assistant coach. In just nine seasons, Benny has coached four Olympians, two Olympic medalists, two world champions, eight NCAA titles, 26 All-American athletes who have won a total of 99 All-American awards. Our first honoree, Benny Brazell. Village to raise a kid, and um, I had a whole village with family and friends in the crowd. 
I see uh, my uncle Mac Perry's out there as well. I mean, growing up, um, I just feel that my mom, my family always taught me to fight hard and never give up. And of course, keep God first, but they raised a, uh, man, I can't say a killer, but a dog, you know what I mean? They taught me, I can't be soft, and now I'm a coach, so at times it's like, I got my high school coach down in the stands, I mean, out there in the audience, Coach Blanks as well, Coach Blanks. Uh, at the end of the day, I really appreciate him for just taking me by the wings and getting to high school. Uh, if you guys know my close friends and family, you guys know in middle school, it wasn't always an easy ride for me. I've been through a lot. Like I always tell my track athletes, I wasn't always a track coach, okay? So at the end of the day, I just appreciate you guys for always keeping me to your side and keeping me humble. Um, I got my friends out there I've been with since elementary, middle school, and they guys keep me humble. I see a guy right now, Mark Boone, he's going to keep me humble no matter what. I mean, everybody else can say, hey, Ben, that's a very nice suit. Mark is going to be that guy. Well, you could do a little better with the, with the belt, you know? So it's going to be something every time. And I appreciate it for always keeping me humble. But I love you guys and much respect. I want to go from there. And again, I'm just honored. I got my granddaddy out in the stands, Benny, uh, of course, and I got my dad. Everybody that came to support me and everybody that came to support everybody else as the Ducties, we got you guys got here safe. And I just appreciate you guys and much love, respect. And as we say, go Tigers. <laughs> Track and field is a one great big family. Our next recipient, Carl, uh, Coach Carl Erickson, has had a profound impact on the pole vaulting world, even though he never pole vaulted as an athlete himself. Carl coached pole vault at both the University of Texas and Baylor, and it was at Baylor that he made his biggest impact in coaching in the 1980s. At Baylor, coached seven athletes who vaulted over 18 feet. I asked him earlier, I said, was that seven? He said, it was probably more, but it was at least seven. Uh, who vaulted over 18 feet. He had three vaulters clear 18 feet in the same NCAA meet. At Baylor, he coached such famous names in, in vaulting as Bill Payne, David Hodge, and the current Baylor vault coach, Brandon Richards, who was part of a pretty famous family, vaulting family himself. Carl, uh, coach Erickson also had the opportunity to make his mark on the pole vaulting world in another unique way, as he was the co-founder of Altius, one of only a few companies that manufacture vaulting poles here in the United States. Altius is unique for many reasons, but for one thing, they don't sell poles online. Rather, vaulters come to the Altius plant to be fitted for their poles and to absorb a little bit of Carl Erickson wisdom. Anyone who has been to a meet where Jen Schur is vaulting has seen the beautiful, personalized vaulting pole covers that she uses to cover her implements in the stadium. Carl personally sews and screen prints those covers for athletes who come to get Altius poles. That level of personal service is rare in the world today. Our next recipient this evening, Carl Erickson. coaches I could find and I picked her brain and experimented and my son finally ended up jumping about 17 6 I think in high school. He was in sixth grade when, when we started and I've had a couple of 17 or 18, 19 footers since then. But I got out of more out of it than he, they did. I couldn't, in fact, today I'm 87 years old and I can't wait to get up and go and coach in the morning. So I owe Povall to you a lot more than they gave me. And I appreciate you people. And we got to have, in fact, 
we just came from Belt and they had a meet down there. And there was more pole vultures than there were people looking at it. And it cut me to the quick. What's wrong with these stupid people? <laughs> they need to be watching the best sport in, in track and field and, in fact, the world. But I appreciate coming here. This is the, one of the greatest honors I've ever had. I got a couple of my pole vultures here. And, you know, I've been one in a black hat, <laughs> and another one in a white shirt. We're both 18 footers, and great club lovers, and great guys. And to this day, I love them like nothing else. Thank you very, very much. I Coach, and he was also inducted last year into the Vaulting Magazine Hall of Fame in the inaugural class they had in the Vaulting Magazine <laughs> Hall of Fame last year. As a freshman at New Boston High School in the 1950s, Sid made it to the Texas State Track Meet in the 100, and he did so as a high school freshman with New Boston not having a track for him to train on, not even having a track coach. His sophomore year, he got fourth at state, and New Boston decided they needed to get a track coach to help him along the way. As a high school junior, he won his first gold at the state meet, and by his senior year, he won the 100, the 200, the long jump, and New Boston ended up winning the state title. I imagine his coach was glad to come along for the ride. <laughs> Sid went to East Texas State, which is now Texas A&M Commerce, to start his collegiate career. In 1959, Sid had a feat for the ages when he ran a, a 9-300 yard dash and a 19.6 220 on the same day. Let that sink in just a little bit. He ran a 19.6 in the 220. The run was apparently wind aided, but there weren't always wind gauges in those days. It was recognized as the world record. Let me give you a comparison. Usain Bolt won the 2016 Olympics in the 200 meters with a time of 20.79. 19.79, let's try that. 19.79, Sid ran a 19.6 in the 220, which is actually four feet longer than the 200 meters. I know it was hand time with the wind, but I don't care if it was time with a sundial with a hurricane in his back. <laughs> Sid ran 19.6. It was after that feat that sports riders around the country began to call him Sid the Jet. Although he qualified for the U.S. Olympic trials, he ended up not competing in the trials that year in 1960. He may share some of that story tonight. I read a funny story when he was inducted in the Texas A&M Commerce Sports Hall of Fame where he said he appreciated being inducted in the hall when he was still alive to enjoy the moment. Well, tonight we are happy to see Sid inducted in the Texas Track Hall of Fame and he is here to enjoy the moment. Sid Garden. Anyway, I, I, I don't have a story. 
speech for you, but I did bring a book and I got dropped. <laughs> tell my life story. So I got in touch with another guy, his name, and he uh, he come all the way to New Boston just to see me. And he said, I'm going to induct you into our track hall of fame. Uh, so I did, but anyway. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> this little girl come along. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> 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 second year and I I've won some races, a few races, drink relays and all that kind of stuff. But then I went back home and got with my first love, Kathy Garfield. Field Athlete of the Year. 
Toya went to Texas A&M to run track and play football. Why wow, Texas A&M? Toya won the Big 12 Conference one, uh, 104 straight years. And in 1997, he was on the Texas A&M Sprint Relay that won every single time they stepped on the track that year. 12 races, they won them all. Finishing the year winning the NCAA National Title. In his football career, Toya was a three-time captain at Texas A&M and would be drafted by the 49ers. He played pro football in the NFL, the CFL, and the XFL. Our next recipient, Toya Jones. <laughs> Chair that has been coaching me since I was about six years old, y'all. AAU track meets. His name is Tim Freeman. Him and his wife came through the storm to get here, and I appreciate everything you've done for me, Coach. We have another coach. His name is uh, George Harris. He's not here right now, but I thank you. And also Alfred Marshall, who's up in heaven with my father. Those are great men who helped form me, and also. She might not even know this, but fighting with my sister all the time <laughs> made me fast too. <laughs> She's a little bit older, and I'm big now, but I wasn't always the biggest. <laughs> One time the dog pooped, my mom said, pick it up. I said, you pick it up. She said, no, you pick it up. So I go to pick it up, she pushes me. And goes, That's the kind of sister she was. But she was also a good athlete. And one thing I wanted to say, so back when we, um, we all ran at the big stadium, AMT. Right. Right. It, it wasn't a side track, it wasn't anything. And when I was at the state meet, I was going up for winning my fifth medal. I was tired, it was after the 200, you know, it's the end of the beat. I, I, I'm down on one knee, I'm getting up to accept the award. And I looked in that big stadium, and I had a standing ovation. And that's when it made me feel like the best person, most electric, everything in the whole world, and it made me love track even more. It made it more in the sport. It made it something that made me feel like, wow, hard work pays off. Pays off. Because right. Coach Freeman attested this. I did win a lot of meets, but I would stay late. I would go there first, and I put in the time. And you should do that in everything you do. It doesn't have to be track, but always do a little extra. And I'm not going to preach y'all, just <laughs> I know some stuff while I'm talking to people. <laughs> And also, I just want to say, can y'all all please keep supporting track? Maybe. Just like he said, he went to the meet, there were more pole vaulters than people in the stands. Yep, track time. takes a full day. Mm -hmm. But go up in there and support everyone That's to right. show that this sport is something. Because right. there's no sport that you can't, you don't have to run. Unless you play golf. Sorry, golf guys. But <laughs> you have to run to do soccer, right. football, basketball, everything. 
And it starts here. Right. And I want track to get stronger. I want people to be like in other countries, get to actually support it more. Mm -hmm. And all the best athletes, I think, are here, especially the people are right here I'm lined up with, people that are in that uh, little folder. So thank you for bringing me here. Thank I appreciate you. it. God bless. Our next recipient, Leo Manzano, immigrated to the United States from a small town in central Mexico when Leo was four years old. They moved to Marble Falls where Leo became interested in running at a young age. He did not come from a running family. I read that he had to make a deal with his father. His father felt like he needed to be working in the fall. He said, if I work full time all summer, will you let me run cross country? And he did. And yet he flourished with some of these challenges he had. He won nine UIL 4A titles in track and in cross country. He went to the University of Texas and in the fall of his freshman year he began to fear that he might not be able to move up to the higher mileage training regimen uh, that's required at the college level as he couldn't always finish some of the training runs. His coach told him if he would follow his training plan diligently he would be able to become a great runner. How well did that work for Leo? In his freshman year indoors as a freshman Leo broke four minutes in the mile and won the NCAA 1500 outdoors as a freshman. He would go on to win a total of five NCAA titles in the indoor mile and the outdoor 1500 and was awarded nine All-American titles. So apparently the program did work. <laughs> Immediately after his senior year at UT, Leo qualified for the 2008 Olympics and getting to the semifinals in Beijing. Still training in Austin, Leo qualified in 2012 Olympics in London and he made the finals where he runs one of the greatest races I have ever seen. I watched a video of that race online in preparation for tonight. I watched it over and over again. As Leo goes from ninth place to second place over the final 160 meters of the race against the greatest runners in the world, he wins silver and he very nearly won the gold. Of course, if you saw Leo run very much, he, uh, he had that kick, and there was a kick like none others. He probably should have stayed a little bit closer earlier in the race, but it, it worked for him well. Leo came so very close to qualifying for the team again in 2016. He got fourth place, even though he had been fighting a virus for months at that point, and he missed by a millisecond, making his third Olympic team. He retired in 2019. Our next recipient, Leo Manzano. Good evening. It's not a good night, right? It's actually a really good night. Well, first of all, thank you, everyone. My notes just went under. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Well, just feeling super honored to be here. Um, thank you all so, so much. Um, so many people to thank James, Stuart, all, all of you that in this association, former athletes, coaches. Um, I mean, phenomenal story. Uh, I know you've been outside the sport, Benny, for quite some time now, and uh, just phenomenal to, just, just to see your track record on and off the track, because it's just so amazing. Um, and as you guys know, we have learned so much from track and field from running. Yes. Um, it literally, life is like a marathon. Uh, perhaps in, uh, in my case, it was a 1,500 meters or a, a mile, and boy, did that hurt. <laughs> um, going back to the story of breaking four minutes, I, I spent about 45 minutes after puking. Uh, so that was, that was fun, but, uh, <laughs> but going back to, to, to life, we learned so much, and uh, in terms of just young athletes and people, I think we can all learn so much from running, right? Because r running is such a parallel to life. So many times in life, uh, there are, we all have our ups and downs. Just like in, in a run or in a race, you're gonna have those uphill battles or you know, have to go uphill. And you have to know that at the, end of, uh, at the other side of that hill, 
you know, there is a finish line, right? There, there is a, we are going to be able to get over that hill, but it all starts with first believing in yourself, right? You believe in yourself and you can do anything. And I, I truly believe that. Uh, looking back at my story, uh, coming from Mexico, and I mean, I remember barely making it, and my parents living off of just rice and beans, and now I love rice and beans because those were literally what supported me along the way. Um, and from not having shoes, and my first coach, Coach Norman, gave me my first pair of running shoes. Um, and so that, you know, people like you that have held me up and held all of us up uh, to be able to go on to the next level. And I'll tell you, it felt damn good winning that silver medal. <laughs> So again, I just want to just thank my family, my friends, James Barr with the Texas Relays. Um, I know a couple of you have, uh, have probably met James or have heard of the Texas Relays. And if you have, um, you know, definitely continue going out there and supporting that event, which because it's a phenomenal event. It's a part of our Texas culture. Um, really awesome. We've even had some uh, Taramara Indians from the, in the past run from San Marcos all the way up to Austin. I mean, that's about 30 miles. And believe it or not, that's actually short for those guys. They normally run like 100 to 150 miles. Um, but just a phenomenal event. I um, also want to thank Coach Bubba. He's not here tonight, but uh, just a person that was there along the way. And, you know, having this kid um, at, you know, 5'5", five, five, you know, for this perhaps very, you know, a bit underprivileged background. Um, but Coach Bubba really took me under his wing and kind of kind of brought me through what he brought me through. And because of that, I was able to get a, a, a Division I college education, uh, go on. And now um, I, I am still involved in the sport and very, very blessed that I, I can still be involved and in now uh, hopefully contributing. I, you know, I just started out. Um, you know, you, you, you've, you've been doing this for quite some time. so. Again, my, my hat's off to you, Benny, because that's just everything you're doing is so amazing. Um, and I definitely, perhaps not in coaching for me, but um, I, I'm definitely going to have to follow in your footsteps. Um, I don't know if you guys know, I just recently retired this last year, um, leaning on the tacos a little more now. <laughs> um, but with that, guys, I just want to say thank you all so much. Um, again, super, super proud to have represented the United States. Uh, in London, in Beijing, and was just two tenths of a second from representing in that third Olympic. So, but with that, uh, hook them horns. What? For you younger people, this next story is going to be pretty surprising to you. In the 1970s, there was no such thing as the internet or social media. <laughs> there was one primary source of track and field info on the national stage, and that was track and field news. Yep. Larry's story felt like there was a story to be told by concentrating on Texas track and field, and with that idea, Texas track and field news was born. Larry gathered the in info from around the state, edited, wrote, and published the Texas track and field news. He had classification breakdowns, top tens in every classification, stats on Texas track and field athletes. You know who subscribed to the newsletter, among others? Track and field coaches from around the country. I'm convinced that many, many Texas high school athletes were recruited because track coaches read about them in the Texas track and field news. Before Larry comes up here, I want to ask for a show of hands that will certainly date many of us in the crowd. Raise your hand if you subscribe to Texas Track and Field News. Absolutely. I know that in my earliest years of announcing, I used that Texas Track and Field News extensively to provide me info on the athletes I was announcing. There was no athletic.net. There was no mile split. There was no flow track. No tefers. There was Larry Story gathering information from coaches and meet directors around the state to tell the story of Texas Track and Field. As a contributor to Texas track and field history, Larry Story is a well-deserving inductee into the Texas Track and Field Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> 
recipient, Monty Stratton, actually started as a buckaroo, an honest-to-goodness buckaroo running for Breckenridge High School, where he was state champion, setting the state record 9.4 in the 100-yard dash back in the 60s. He went to Abilene Christian College, was an All-American sprinter on some of those great ACC teams in the late 1960s under Bill McClure. Fresh out of college, Monty entered the coaching ranks with stints at Corpus Christi King, Austin Westlake, and then Richardson High School. Coach Stratton then moved to the college ranks where he's first served as an assistant coach at SMU before moving to UTA as the head coach and would finish his coaching career as the head coach at TCU. It was at UTA that Coach Stratton enjoyed some of his greatest successes. He was named the Southland Conference Coach of the Year 13 times. His men's and women's team won a total of 15 Southland Conference team titles. Between his time at UTA and TCU, Coach Stratton coached 27 NCAA Division I All-Americans had athletes who claimed 132 births in the NCAA Indoor Championship and 33 births in the Outdoor Championship meet. Please welcome our final inductee of the evening, Monty Stratton. It is quite an honor to be a part of the group that is being inducted tonight as a very elite field, and I, I'm humbled to be a part. Congratulations to all my fellow inductees, and congratulations to all those who are already a member. It is special for me to be here tonight, especially because I've got a lot of former athletes 
who either ran for me at the collegiate level, quite a few of them who ran post-collegiately as pros. And I am so, so thrilled to see your faces in the audience. You never know how much I love you. Of course, I want to thank all the committee members who made the selection, especially my good friend, Coach Barbara Crossan. I appreciate having been thought of and included in this elite group. Some of my athletes who are here, Olympic medalists, world championship medalists, NCAA champions, multiple times. Professional athletes who have gone to multiple Olympics, multiple world championships, elite of the elite. The most loyal, storied, Greatest friend I've got, Doc Patton. Thank you for showing up. Wow. <laughs> Shante Moore of the University of Arkansas fame. Portia Lucas of Texas A&M both ran post-collegiately with us. Jared Connaughton, Canadian national champion and Olympian, ran post-collegiate. Also want to thank Glendale Freighter brother of Michael Freider, who ran on the World Championship Jamaican <laughs> four by one. The Freider boys were remarkable. Steve Slowly, isn't that a good name for a sprint? <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you being here, Steve. Steve was part of the still National Collegiate record holding four by two. We're still hanging on to that one. <laughs> I also want to make special mention of the best assistant coach I ever had. Dan Waters is the only assistant coach I ever had who I felt did a better job in that position than I ever did. That's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> the best coach I've ever had, and now Dan is a perennial top 10, top 5 men and women's team at the University of Alabama. I'm sure that Nick Saban consults with him regularly. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, for showing up. My journey from Breckenridge was a gravel parking lot on the west side of the football stadium. Football at Breckenridge in the 50s and 60s was not life and death, but way more important than that. <laughs> so our track was the gravel parking lot beside the football stadium. I lucked out the last couple of years and had a couple of coaches who had actually run track in college and knew that you turned left and that helped immensely. <laughs> <laughs> Having attained a scholarship at Abilene Christian, I was allowed the opportunity to earn a degree, which was the first degree in my family. It allowed me to escape, to escape a lifetime of working poor. Back at that time, teachers were really respected and I wanted to be one. So I'm very, very grateful for that opportunity and track provided that. As mentioned in the introduction, I coached at three different high schools, three different universities. We won two national championships during my tenure as an assistant at SMU. I know close only counts in dancing, but we were one point away from winning two championships at TCU. The best experience, and you can't start out like this, you have to go through the steps and pay your dues and go over the speed bumps and earn your stripes. But the most enjoyable 10 years of my coaching career were post-collegiate. I did not have to recruit anyone. Anyone, and this includes Coach Waters in the back, anyone who tells you they enjoy recruiting is not being very really genuine or they are brain damaged. <laughs> Recruits are always 17. And unless you die, you're older. <laughs> so, not having to recruit those past 10, the last 10 years working with the professionals, the roles reversed. No longer did the athletes work for me, as they did in the collegiate breaks, but I became their employee, and I liked that a lot better. <laughs> Had a great career 
four by one national record until Florida broke it this past spring, four by two national record that still holds. Multiple, multiple Olympic medalists due to their genetic jackpot. <laughs> World championship medalists, NCAA medalists, three state championship uh, winners at the, at, the, at the high school level. I enjoyed every single minute, even the bad minutes. I miss it. I could be right back into it in 15 seconds, but I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> so, again, I thank you to everyone involved in making this possible. And it is such an honor, I am humbled. As we near the finish of our festivities this evening, I hope that all of you have seen the numbers that were released recently that showed for high school boys, Texas has the most participants with 74,522 participating in high school boys track and field in Texas. California was second. There were 21,000 runners less than Texas. And then it drops all the way to 24,000 for third place Ohio. For high school girls, Texas again leads the way with 53,566 participants in high school track and field. Then there's an 8,000 person drop down to California in second with 45,000 and Pennsylvania in third with 24,000. It is because of the men and the women in this room and your colleagues in the track coaching profession here in Texas that our great state has more than 128,000 high schools, high schoolers, uh, participating in the great sport of track and field. This also translates to Texas having a disproportionately high number of athletes competing at the college level. Because of you, the Texas Track and Field Coaches Association members will continue to see a flood of athletes who will be moving into this Hall of Fame in the coming decades. Thank you for what you do for Texas, the greatest track and field state in the United States. Thank you very much for coming out for this 11th edition of the Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony.